All right, we're off. We'll just let people kind of come through right now. All right, I can see 27, 20, 29, 31 attendees. It's great to see everyone travel through. Cool, thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us at our second ArcuPro webinar of the year in conjunction with Peter Fowl Concrete. Um, my name is Emma Hanley, and I'm the campaign manager um, here at ArcuPro. Some of you may have worked with me at the Meet, Greet, and Eat event. I'll just let a few of you guys trickle through. Um, and while you do, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, any questions that you have throughout, feel free to pop them in the chat function um, in the box, just down kind of in the middle of your Zoom bar, um, and we'll address any of those questions at the end. Just give it a couple um, more seconds for everyone to come through. And while we wait, if everyone can please just test that chat function um, by letting me know whereabouts you are in New Zealand, or, you know, where you're dialing in from, and what the weather's like out your way, you can feel free to pop um, an emoji in there as well to represent the weather. So that it looks quite nice where Ross is. Mm. Nice and sunny out that way in Point Chef. Yep. <laughs> Concrete everywhere. Yeah. Sunny in Christchurch, brilliant. Auckland and sunny, that's what we like to see heading into the weekend. Beautiful here in Telpo. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Sunshine throughout, that's great. Marangi Beach, sunny and offshore, brilliant. Alrighty, I'll just give it another few seconds while everyone joins the um, webinar, fantastic. Still a few more coming through. Alrighty. All right, I'm going to get into it. Cool. So um, as I mentioned, my name's Emma. Um, I'm the campaign manager here at ArchiPro, and I'm really delighted to be hosting this webinar, Designing with Concrete, in conjunction with Peter Fell Concrete. Um, it's no surprise that the topic of today is concrete, which is becoming increasingly popular in contemporary architecture. No longer is it just for the brutalists. Leading designers and architects are using it to create forms, shapes, and texture that express a huge range of architectural ideas. We're seeing curves, color, and contrast. Shortly, we'll be listening to a panel discussion moderated by our managing editor, Joanna Session, um, from Peter Fowles regional manager, Paul Dwight, architect Rich Nash from RTA Studio, and concretologist Ross Bannon from Bannon Construction. Our panelists will be discussing the latest innovations in concrete and the exciting new ways architects are using this old age material. The format will be a 30 minute panel discussion and a 15 minute interactive Q&A after. So as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, any questions you have, please just jump in that chat function um, and let us know what you'd like uh, to discuss after. So to begin with, I'd love to do a quick poll so our panelists can get an understanding of how everyone has interacted with concrete previously. You'll see a poll pop up in the middle of your screen. And if you can please take 30 seconds to answer the questions, that would be fantastic. So we'll get that poll going now. All right, if you can please yeah, give that a go. That would be fantastic. Not a lot of work. So we can see some answers coming in here. Favorite aspects of designing with concrete. A lot of people are saying textural surfaces. Brilliant. Our panelists, can you see these answers trickling in? Uh, I can't see any answers on no, this. No, I can't see any. All right, I can share those with you um, in a second. All right, well, thanks so much for that, guys. Um, without taking up any more of your time, I'll pass it on to Jo to kick off the panel discussion. Hi, guys. Hi, Paul, Rich, and Ross. Lovely to have you here today. Um, as you know, uh, we've got uh, the sort of theme of the day is curves, colour, and contrast. So I'm going to kick off by asking a question that, you know, any of you can go ahead and jump on. Um, what are the latest trends in concrete in architecture? 
I think probably uh, being that it's a Peter Fowl um, hosted event, I should kick off with that one. Um, and thank you, Rich, and thank you, Ross, for, for jumping in on with us today. Um, so for over 30 years, Peter Fowl's been supplying the New Zealand and South Pacific market with, with a range of Lanxus coloured oxides, so a range of over 80 colours. Um, trends of late um, have been into your super whites, uh, your whites and into our moody charcoal black ranges very popular at the moment. Um, but it gives a real freedom for designers with over 80 colours to really align the colour scheme they want to do with their internal and external decor, um, fitting into settings and so forth. So I know that Rich and Ross have done numerous projects around the country and they could probably elaborate to, to where colours work for them. Um, but, you know, the freedom, the freedom really with some new ranges of late, which we've put in the gelato range, which is a, a quite a punchy color range of white-based cement colors um, that have raspberries and, and uh, apricots and those sorts of really, really popular bright colors. Um, probably not used so much in housing, but definitely in decorative manner. And we've just recently listed, um, and please go to the website and you'll see all the ranges there, but the pastel range, which is a, a beautiful softer tonings, um, which we're really excited about. So I'll hand it over to the, uh, someone else to have a chat about that. Yeah, I could I could follow on there. Um, thanks, Paul. With yeah, obviously we've used quite a quite a, a bit of coloured concrete, um, and, and, and mostly in the in the darker ranges for floors, particularly really dark, your darkest colour, and then a, a gloss finish or on a floor it works really really well on a lot of our residential projects. But we also we like the sort of earthy colours. Um, where we're trying to match contextually with um, landscape and that sort of thing. So we've used some of the terracottas and um, matching with the Auckland Red Scoria. We, we did that at um, Freeman's Bay Primary School. So a combination of colour but with texture as well. And when we've worked with Ross on a lot of in situ concrete projects, we've often just used the charcoals and things to darken the concrete. Um, there's one particularly interesting project that we did in Grotham Street where, with Ross where we, we wanted to replicate um, aged concrete. Uh, it's where designer rugs are housed at the moment in the corner of Grosvenor Street and Eagle Road, and and we you know we used a combination of a retardant and rugosol, and Ross worked his magic there to sort of create a finished and situ monolith of concrete look that looked like it was already a hundred years old. So um, there's some of the trends in our world. Yeah, um, you know, working with the, with the colours and, and that sort of thing, and where it's all heading, um, it, it's. It's just endless what, what can what, what, what you can achieve and, and with architects like Rich and many others obviously and the guys at Peter Fell we're we're achieving a, a sort of infinite bloody number of finishes really we're um, getting clients and architects with at us all the time um, talking about you know what they want to achieve and their budgets and and the look of whether they're trying to match the environment or they've got specific resource consent requirements they need to be at a certain level of color and things like that so. Um, th there's a lot of elements we work with and, and the testing that we do, um, it, it all lends itself to, you know, what, what the client wants and, and, and sometimes what they, what they unexpectedly want as well, because you'll, you'll throw them something and they'll think, you know, they looks really good. It's like that Grosvenor Road one, right? They took a little, little bit of to and froing, but I think we got a great result. And then when we did release it, which came up and, and we were sort of, uh, blasting the surface of it a little bit but then you know he's like no nah, just touch it you know and, and it really made an, an, another look to it entirely as well so th there's all, all sorts of things you can do with the colors and, and things and 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 it's uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a sort of natural color too so it's really it dries out so it changes all the time too a little bit so it's good to have those samples and things so mm -hmm. And are any of you seen sort of, you know, um, projects where we've been quite adventurous with the colours, um, the colour range, sort of, you know, getting into any of those pastels or, or other colours like that yet? From my perspective, personally, I haven't, I haven't had a, haven't had a specification come through. But to be honest with you, we don't know a lot of the time what the guys are working on out there. Um, it could be three years from, from releasing these products to a project coming to the, to the fore. So, Rish might, uh, yeah. might know of something, but 
Um, no, I, I personally done in the past, but look, yeah, it could well be. Mm. Yeah, you know, there is, I mean, we've, we've, we haven't got anything on the boards right now using some of those strong colours, more of the earthy ones and the reds and terracottas around the sort of connection with natural landscape, but there's some fantastic projects internationally. There's one by David Chipperfield in Barcelona, which is a justice centre where um, he's, there's a number of high-rise and situ concrete towers that are all slightly different pastel colours that link to the regional tones of Spain. And, and it's a beautiful project. Um, so, you know, I'm glad you've got those colours there, Paul, because we've got projects in our, in our pipeline where we'd like to use more of, you know, get more adventurous with colour. And I think there's a little bit, uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in brick at the moment. And, and I think parallel to that, uh, pigmented concrete is, is also coming. Um, well, I don't really like to talk about trends so much in our architectural world, but I think it's something that um, is coming into a place where we um, are, are ready to be adventurous with it, shall we say? Yeah, it's very, there's, there's definitely a lot of excitement out there since we've released the ranges. Um, obviously, COVID's put a, lot of, put a lot of hold on a lot of things, and the ranges have only just realistically come out in the last sort of six to, to 12 months for the pastel range. But um, absolute excitement from from the softness that, uh, and I really do see a lot of projects coming through with this on. It might be a highlighted wall in the house, or it might be, you know, we do a lot of we do a lot of um, projects where we're doing highlighting in smaller areas. But and that's where these sort of come in. Um, you do a lot of paths and, and architectural. Well, on my hand, there's a sort yeah. of a doctrine with architects that goes sort of rooted back in the modernist days of this honesty to material, which is um, which has probably been a little bit of reluctance with architects to get too adventurous with with concrete. But I think you know we're well and truly moved out of that period. Um, but you know we love concrete that looks like concrete, and and look you know might you know like talk about we try to age it or we'll do a real rough rough board finish or really smooth beautiful finish just tweak the color up and down with light or dark um, but I, I i do think that we live in a, a totally pluralistic world now where we can totally sort of um, start to open our eyes to using the material in a more colorful way mm -hmm. mm. and we, we spent a um in the past we've we've played around with mixing the colors during the single pour as well which been pretty cool which i haven't really shown these guys um we, we were trying to match the terraformer of a, of a cliff face or something like that mm -hmm. and that worked really well it looks 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 real awesome but it's really difficult to get right you know to match from one to another to another so and it means multiple concrete trucks on site at one time so we played around <coughs> a little bit some things like that but i'm yet to find a client willing enough to go and take it you know fully um <laughs> And then obviously just we've done a hell of a lot of whites and things and in, in with all sorts of self-cleaning agents and, and things in them. So, you know, that the carbon in there basically cleans it. So we're doing another one like that soon in Parnell, which I'm sure some of you may know about, which um which is all going to be self-cleaning as well. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and this is sort of follows on from what you're saying, Ross. Um, but, you know, what are the um, challenges with building with concrete? Um, yeah, challenges like yeah, New Zealand's getting really good at it now. Like, you know, when I first got into it, it was pretty raw here, and you know, the, the level of detail probably wasn't right there. But you know, we spent a lot of time working on that, and and now, um, you know, working with architects and, and builders and designers around around New Zealand and, and spending a lot of time overseas, we're getting we're getting really good at it and there's a hell of a lot of really good competent builders and, and um, contractors out there now who are able to achieve these so so it, the you know the designers can design anything but it's a matter of putting it into a 3d world right so and into a into a, a um, standard which everyone's really proud of you know you, you last thing you want to do is have a have a crap house you know crap you know finishes and all this sort of thing because you know you only need one out of a hundred like that, and it puts off a hundred builders doing it, you know, because they hear about a bad experience. But um, so these challenges and things. But with the amount of knowledge in the industry, from the designers to Concrete NZ to the Allied Concrete to you know all of these people, you know, with the mixed designs that they can do, 
um, and Peter Fell. You know, we we there's a lot of people out there with a lot of knowledge who who can bring it all together now in New mm -hmm. Zealand, and and I really think we're we're a leading edge in, in the world in the moment. You know, um, and you know, and, and, if, and if we don't know something, we've all got contacts somewhere who can ask and, and, and get and get questions answered, you know. So I often get sent emails, you know, just people wanting to know certain things and how did they achieve this or whatever and, and go from there. But but working with architects and designers at an early stage in, in the design, the concept is always so crucial with concrete. You know, you need to understand the budget, the finish thereafter and you know in the environment you know where is it going to be built is it in the out, out the end of bloody you know bay of islands and on rafferty or somewhere or is it in, in central auckland you know so you need to you need to understand these things and then understand the contractors who will be involved you know who are doing it who can help yeah i think from an architect's point of view i, I, I can't um under um, over or overstate, I can't overstate how complex um, concrete getting a concrete finish is, and and the dependence on, you know, it's easy to draw things and it's um, easy to have a, a vision in your mind or a rendering of what it's going to look like, but to actually achieve that, it, it's one of the few trades where we absolutely have to work with craftsmen, special specialists like Ross and and color colorologists like Paul. Because if you just think you can pour any old concrete into some shuttle work and you'll end up with something that looks like potato endo in Japan, you'll, you'll be absolutely wasting clients' money and it'll be a lot of money wasted. So um, it is a, an area that requires an enormous amount of careful research and conversation and um, collaboration really with experts. Yeah, we do a lot of we do a lot of collaboration early on with the with the architects. As you know, there may be an LRB issue depending on where the site's been built, um, like refractive value. So you know, Central Otago is a classic one where it's you know you 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 have a number of homes down there that LRB is really important. So you know, as Richard just said, early engagement with us um, is really essential too because we have all those numbers. Um, obviously, working with Ross and the likes of Ross around the countryside. There is, there is many times where you'll want to do a sample for the client to, to actually see this thing uh, in its true form. So you're dealing with natural resources in those areas. So um, yeah, yeah, we it's we're solution providers for the right at the early stages, and it's and it's it's, it's a huge collaboration between the yeah, between the you, sectors, really. Yeah, but you've got um, if builders are listening here and that sort of thing. Um, the big, biggest thing I get when I, when I get involved with these things is, is the builders themselves are you know who've been given the job and they're like oh come to Ross and he'll help you out is that they're just sort of a little bit tentative about jumping into it and and risking you know risking the kids shoes for uh, on it and that sort of thing so but don't be afraid that there's there's a lot of people out out here in New Zealand who are really helpful in this industry, you know, and, and we'll answer all sorts of things because we're all, all all about promoting this product and, and making homes that last, you know. So um, don't be afraid to send me emails or Paul or, you know, all, all these guys. Who, we'll answer them straight away, you know. I get I get answer, uh, questions sent to me from everywhere from bloody the Caribbean to back, in, back into Scotland, all sorts of places because they – you know, and, and we answer them straight away, and, and you know, but we love it. You know, me and my son, and um, a few others who, who I've instructed around New Zealand, they're all into it, and and they, you know, we'll answer anything, you know, and, and and tell you what will work and what won't work, and or you know what we've done, and we'll send you more than anything, we'll send you images of how it's done, so you know, pictures worth a thousand words, sort of thing, you know. Cool. And sort of on the, on the same note, um, this question is for Paul. What would you like architects and designers to know about using concrete in their projects? Well, I think um, I think the diversity of concrete. I mean, it's it's um, it can be put into so many different forms, different textures. Uh, absolutely huge around a range of colours that we have. So um, it's endless in that sector. We do do bespoke colours for certain projects. So. If you have something in mind that's not in our range, just, just talk to us about that. Um, but one of the, as just alluded to before, is about early collaboration. So we'll, you know, we get a lot of people say, hey, I've got a client that wants to do this. What are your thoughts? And then we all talk to people that, within the industry, engineers and, and the people we have relationships with to, to help along the way. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, you're talking about an environmentally friendly, fireproof 
uh, cost-effective product. So, so Conquer in itself, for, for those reasons, a great product to go with. For us, we are there to, to offer enhancement, to, to work through the project as far as looking after the, the concrete when it's being poured, understanding what it's going to sort of definitely making sure the client understands what the outcome is going to be before the thing's built is a really good option because a lot of people tend to sometimes think you can form something that's made in a factory look, if you like, and it's, and it's, and it's not. It's a very natural product. So you do get colour shadings and so forth from the flow of pouring and, and, and obviously Russell expand on that but for us it's just about asking those questions um you know we all support the specification we'll support through with qualified guides doing application of sealers and so forth at the end um obviously we'll help with the with the specifications all the way through and, and obviously master spec and the, and the likes have all those on there so um so yeah so i think the first thing is is get in touch um we have a fantastic showroom in auckland a few if you've got a client that's really serious about doing a doing a home or a commercial project, it's well worth the effort to come to the showroom. Um, that's a very good start point. Got some fantastic knowledge up there with with our team in, in Auckland. So, yeah, but you know, it's a durable, fantastically durable product. Color obviously doesn't fade. It's there for a for the life of the concrete, which you know, I don't know, 100, 150 years. I mean, maintenance free in lots of cases, depending on what you put on the outside, but in most cases, maintenance free. So just really for the architect to get a good understanding of what the project's um, lifespan is for what they want to achieve. Um, had a project recently where the brief was, it's got to be maintenance free because it's a, it's a maintained uh, building by the, basically the, um, the community and they've got a fundraiser to, to, to keep these, these buildings maintained. So if it's a very low maintenance build in the first place, that's, that's fantastic. So, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, just get in touch with us. We were here to help. <laughs> Russ, do you have anything to add to that in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, what you'd like people to know about using concrete? Um, main thing is it, uh, it's the main things with using concrete is do it right the first time, all right, and um, cross your T's and dot your I's. So with the design down to the engineering, to the insulation, to the services in it and all that sort of thing, spend a little bit of time up front um, and, and you'll reap the benefits at the end. And uh, when done right, like um, Paul says, it is an extremely efficient way to build if you do it right. And the more people who uh, start building with it, we'll, we'll certainly start to understand. We're doing a, a huge development soon with a, with a large company where Basically, um, all the homes are going to be concrete now because we can do it so efficiently. Um, the um, and, and yeah, it's just just an easy easier way to build. And and once you do one, you know, it's like riding a bike. You'll you'll learn and you'll learn. You know, I learn every time I pour something, and then even I'll I'll stop. And you, some of these builders might have seen me if, they, if they're listening here. They might have seen me stopping on their sites because I just, just introduce myself every now and then and, and I go and chat to them about what they're doing because it's really interesting to see you know the, their methods and that sort of thing and um, it's it's all it's all about learning through as you as you build it you know mm -hmm. but um yeah okay and uh and this question is for Rich um how are you seeing your clients adopt concrete in their projects how are they using it um in various ways uh the, in terms of our more concrete dominant projects, uh, both with we're using it across the whole um, commercial and residential and education world. Uh, but look, people sometimes we're doing a house in Christchurch where where um, the, the the client are really really attracted to that very smooth off the formwork um, concrete and so, so so that's what we're doing and, and we've achieved an amazing finish with that. Um, uh, uh, you know to contrast to that project we finished in Parnell recently had an incredible the client wanted an incredibly rough almost um, ridiculously rough formed finish so that the concrete was leaking out between the the, the, the rough sawn boards and we had to sort of break it off and we got an amazing sort of light effects as the sun sort of shines across at a certain time of the day. Um, and so it's really different strokes for different folks. You know, so when someone makes a commitment to go with a concrete house or a, you know, particularly with a house where it's a, a, a bespoke sort of project, 
then we just you know we just have to work we have to one of the big things is really important is you, you really have to rub the client's nose in what this product is it's a natural product it's not going to be perfect there will be some variation in it and and that's important for them to understand and we, we take them around other projects and show them so that they don't have an unrealistic expectation about what you know what the result's going to be so that's an important part of it as well but yeah no there it's really um it's it's i think the common analogy to answer that question is that they're after they're looking for the permanence the sculptural quality the almost um earth-like monolithic nature particularly within situ concrete where there's no joints it doesn't come in panels from a precast factory um, and, and that's what we're finding a lot of clients are attracted to in the permanence of that okay thank you um, now this question's uh, the last question that I have, and it's for all of you. Uh, what is the future of concrete in architecture? I think Richie should be a starter on that one. <laughs> well, okay. I, I think um, you know, with our practices, like many architectural practices in all industries, should be right now is heavily, heavily focused on sustainability. So you know, concrete's a wonderful material, and it is sustainable in the sense that it, it's a much more permanent material so that a, a building made of concrete will last three, four, five times longer than a, than a um, lightweight timber building. There's been amazing developments in low carbon concrete and we're starting to use that where we've got cement replacement up to 40%. Um, cement's the real nasty in terms of embodied energy because of the heat that's required, the energy required to make it. So, so I'll speak to the sustainability drive, but I think one has, you know, I think any carbon reduction is a huge success. We don't all have to strive to be carbon zero, but we can't carry on building last century's buildings out of steel and, and heavy carbon concrete, or we're just, we, you know, we're going to put the final nails in our beautiful, um, coffin. So we we need to be sustainably driven for permanent buildings and low carbon mechanisms. Um, so maybe Ross, you could maybe you know you've got some background on low carbon concrete would be interesting. I'm sure to hear about. Yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> yeah, the first thing we always hear when we we sit down at an architect's office is low carbon concrete. So you know it's, that's the driving force. So we're um. HR Cement, who have been dealing with, with um, they've, they've got a great product as well that we're starting to implement quite a bit. But also I'm in discussion at the moment with an American um, about basically carbon-free cement. So we're, it's years away, you know, the development side of it, but we, we are working on it and, and you know, it, it will happen, but it just takes time and a lot of infrastructure to create. Um, there is the technology out there and, um, and, it, and it's something we're working towards for sure. You know, we're doing some government projects at the moment where we've got to, we've got to implement as much of this as possible, you know, because yeah, the sustainability side of it is, is, a, is a massive driver. And um, once we can achieve that, because you do get some people put off by it, you know, because it, it does create a lot of the COT in the atmosphere, you know, the worldwide concrete, I think contributes to about 4%, but you know, it's the second most, uh, used material in the world uh, other than water I think so um, so yeah it's, it's something to think about there but as far as you know and then the sustainability of the house you know you look behind me here that we poured this I don't know the black wall there and, and that about eight nine years ago something like that it hasn't been touched since you know that's you know so it, it's low maintenance and, and very um, maintenance free and, and, and therefore you know once it's up it's there forever until war demolition or someone like that sneak in here and try and build a bigger one, right? <laughs> so, um, but as far as the future of concrete, you know, that's the key one. And then, and then obviously in New Zealand, where we're talking about in particular, is the future in New Zealand concrete is our is our um, are our contractors, you know, to be to be able to um, bring them up to speed. You know, a lot of them are already up to speed, but to bring more of them up, so you know, when they're coming out of you know that they're training and that sort of thing they understand concrete and they've got a drive to to um think outside the square and and challenge themselves more than just going and building a cedar clad house you know you know jump out and do a do, you know do a few feature walls or something like this you know some landscape 
And from there, you'll learn and you learn and then you'll develop and you'll talk to different people in the industry and you get more and more confident and be able to take on these these great you know concepts that come out of these offices of these educated architects which just blow my mind sometimes you know that um so you know just ho hopefully you know we, we can train more of these guys and, and and sort of aid them and 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 make more of these homes sort of more normal in new zealand that's what i'd like to see just uh, just going from a color perspective with, with with the oxide zero made basically out of scrap material so we're fantastic for the for the environment um and so recently we've just had all our oxides declare labelled for well, all those architects out there that want to know that. So it's fantastic for us. Um, but you know, the thing is with with colour and and where's the concrete going? I mean, we're getting people making basins and baths and with the gelato range, which I spoke about earlier. So there's a lot of options going forward with concrete and people are making bed heads with, you know, in situ bed heads with concrete and and as Rich said, rusticated timber look is hugely popular. So you know, the, the, the formworks that are available now, the in situ stuff that you can create, I really don't see concrete um, ever going the other way. I think it's only going to go forward, to be honest. Yeah. Um, now, that was the end of my questions. So thank you so much for answering those. Um, we can see that we've got quite a few questions from um, participants in the chat. So I think, Emma, you're going to choose a few of those um, for everyone to answer. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, so thanks so much, guys. That was, you know, a really insightful panel discussion. And I personally learned a lot. Um, and like Astro said, we have quite a few audience questions. So let me get into one. Um, just from what you're saying as well, um, Paul, I had a comment from Toby. Um, and he said, as a provider of interior concrete products, basins and baths, they've definitely seen a higher uptake um, in the gelato and pastel colours. So interesting on um, your point there. Lovely. Um, yeah, and we've got one from Steve. And Steve's asked, what are the restrictions around specifying concrete? What needs to be um, overcome to specify concrete in architectural builds? Maybe one for you, Rich, potentially. Um, there's not a lot of restrictions in general. I mean, as long as we're meeting the building code and we're meeting all the structural requirements, um, a se seismic um, movement is, is a significant uh, consideration. So we have to provide expansion joints and seismic joints when, when required on large projects. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a very easy product to specify um, in the sense of, of that. But as I mentioned before, the, it's the research and behind the specification of knowing what additives need to be added to the concrete to make it flow correctly. Um, for in situ, that's where it starts to get quite quite technical. So um, that's where the collaboration with an expert um, tradesman and applicator like Ross is a sort of essential. You can't really just make up the specification yourself or just put a standard master spec specification in. That's probably the more complex portion or answer to that question. Yeah. Yes. So, so the. Um with the specifications and that sort of thing around the um, weather tightness and, and windows and all, all this sort of thing, um, we, we developed a code with the NZ Concrete Association years ago, and we're actually updating that code right now. So in, any designer or can go straight to there and, and basically cut and paste. And then we've also got information on sealers right down, you know, to, to um, insulation on that as well. So the, all the information is there. And then with um, how Rich was saying about the, the concretes and that sort of thing, that's where you, you talk to um, a concrete company, your local concrete company is what you want to achieve. And the engineer will also do that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, another question we've got here, what effect will the H1 requirements have on in situ concrete wall panels? Okay, again, um, it's just going to, you're going to need to, we, we as an industry are going to increase the, the insulation properties of concrete. So, um, I mean, already we can't use just uninsulated concrete on exterior walls. We've either got to strap and line it on the inside, but if we want to see the concrete on both sides, we have to use a double panel concrete with the foam insulation buried between it. And that can be made in an uh, in situ situation or a precast situation. Or there's other options with um, concrete that insulate themselves to a certain degree with. Um, with beads and, and pumice and other sort of additives that increase your insulator qualities. But essentially, it's just upping that insulation that we've always had to add anyway. 
Yeah, so, so we've, we've added insulation, you know, for, for a long time into, in, into uh, walls that need it. Um, and you, you can thermally break them. You know, we're doing houses in Crown Range and in Central Otago at the moment down to houses in Rafferty and the Bay of Islands, which aren't thermally broken. So there's all sorts of ways to uh, achieve those and, and, um, and to bring them further up or lower or down or whatever you want to do. But th th there's little tricks when you're doing it in situ, it's, it's a little trickier than precast, obviously, but, but it, it's easy, actually easily achieved. So, um, and there's a lot of that information in, in, the, um, in the New Zealand code as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, another one here from um, Anthony. Um, have you done any complete concrete homes, including the roof? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, no, we've done all sorts of things like that. One home I did, should have been nearly 20 years ago, even had the bath in concrete. There wasn't an ounce no. of it. So uh, it looked amazing, you know. But it, it comes down to everyone's... Um, interpretation of what they want and you know that might have been a bit brutalist for some but you know personally I loved it because you know it's my religion but um <laughs> you know but you work with the juxtaposition of all sorts of materials you know to, to create what you're after and that's where you that's where the architects you know that's why they spend so much time at school right um they, they learn what to do yeah I guess the trickiest part of that is that question I suspect is asking and have we done in situ concrete including the roof because that gets quite difficult and we, we we're doing again some portions of the houses where the wall folds up and becomes the interior ceiling all in one monolithic pool and and uh, that that gets tricky but you know every commercial building or most commercial buildings you'll see around the place have concrete structure concrete walls concrete floors and and concrete roof that's nothing new but i think it's when you do it in an in situ monolithic pool it becomes quite complex but, you know. we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot with the, with the different finishes that we provide through polish pouring to external non-slip texturing that we do in a, in, a, in a texture safe situation that we provide. You know, you're, you're seeing a concrete being used in every form of the build these days. So, you know, you can have very smooth surfaces to very textured. So there's no, the seamless really is what can be created. Uh, I saw a house in Auckland that was done all by shutters years ago and I thought it was pretty cool. And, it didn't have a bath made of concrete, but it was certainly fitted in perfectly. <laughs> yeah. All right, we've got another one um, kind of around the polished concrete topic. Um, so with polished concrete floors and the new E3 requirements um, in, in kitchens and bathrooms, how do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. And it's one that we're just getting our head around ourselves because when you specify a polished concrete floor, generally people are carrying that through to your, your laundry, your kitchen. They don't want to have a step point down from tiles or timber or whatever. So if you're doing polished concrete in the whole house, they're basically saying in the C3, it's got to be a tank um, anywhere where there's a sanitary machine, like a washing machine, dishwasher, um, which, which leads me back to the apartment looking drainage hole, um, a tank situation, which obviously is not going to allow concrete to do that uh, unless you've got a waterproof membrane, which, which is generally what you do when you're laying tiles and so forth. So. We're actually, be, we're actually going to be talking to MB who, who um, create this. So from our perspective, it's, it's early doors on that discussion. But um, yeah, it will certainly throw a different uh, avenue to that follow through of right through from a dining room into a kitchen. Uh, then Rich, have you come across that and had any thoughts? Uh, no, so the only thing I was going to add to that is that no, we haven't confronted this new code change sort of in detail yet, but um, often with houses we'll do two, two pours, we'll do the structural slab pour, uh, which gives you opportunity to, to do some waterproofing and membraning on that level, and then you can do sec secondary pours for your actual um, trappable surface, and that's particularly useful when you've got underfloor heating, um, you know, and, and, you, and, and you want very, very high quality, high um, polished finish, you know, through, at the end of the construction period when the whole house has been thrashed to bits with tradespeople, you can then come in and lay the concrete last, um, membranes in place and all that sort of thing, and then just polish it at the last minute, almost like when you're doing the carpet. Hmm. Yeah, that'd, that'd be an interesting one to see, because from, from, you know, we're looking at it as, a, as if they're saying they want it coved, tanked, uh, we get a lot of people that, you know, over, over the time have, have polished their bathroom floors and then wanted a seamless entry into a shower. So, you know, mm -hmm. these these new these new codes are challenging those sorts of things, but um, we'll work through it for sure. Sounds good. 
Um, and what use of concrete would you like to see more of? <laughs> well, I'm going to say like carbon concrete. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say coloured concrete everywhere. <laughs> yep. Um, it, it's just the challenging concrete more than anything you know like the the stuff that you sort of look at and go how the hell did they do that you know you know that's what I, I really love seeing projects like that going that was interesting it took a lot of thought you know and um yeah th those are the ones I, I love seeing you know anyone can do normal but it's you know the extraordinary yeah. it curved and you know the curves and and what we're doing with cnc cutters and, and computers now we can create molds that you wouldn't believe you know at the moment i'm twisting some concrete that sort of bends on itself you know it mm. you know it looks like someone's grabbed this flat bit and just twisted it but it's you know it's just that challenging sort of concrete i'd love to see more yeah and i i'm slightly more serious say other than um low carbon concrete like what i what i do really enjoy to see happening in new zealand is that we have tended to be a country of building temporary houses, temporary buildings, lightweight timber, this and that. And there's, you know, when you visit Europe particularly and you see these masonry buildings that have just literally been around for centuries, you know, that's a, that's a longevity and a commitment to, to architecture that um, can really only be achieved with concrete. And, and that's what I really enjoy working with clients that are, are looking to build a legacy well beyond their lifetime, not, not just a... A 20 year fix before they move on and build another one or move into another one. Yeah, we've, we've, we've um, this is a little bit away from concrete, but we've, we're putting colour into rammed earth situations. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of like rammed earth will last, I'd imagine, some of the concrete has got cement in as well, which is what our oxides react with only. So, you know, the potential, potential going forward of, of concrete is, a, a, it's a real, um, Physical presence, I think, a concrete building. I really love the I love the. I just recently completed a project with a, an architect down in, in Papamaa Beach and Tauranga there, and you know they wanted it to set right into the dunes and and uh, be there for a long, long time and just look right. And it, and it certainly does. It's it's a fantastic finish. Yeah, it's, it's people's land art that they're leaving. You know, it's, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, we're slowly creeping into the 45 minute mark. So I think I'm going to wrap up the audience questions here. But any that haven't been answered, please feel free to reach out to Peter Fell Concrete, um, RTA Studio, or Banner Construction on the ArchiPro profile. And I'm sure our panelists will be really happy to um, answer any remaining questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us at today's Designing with Concrete webinar. Um, and a big thank you, of course, to our panelists, Rich, Paul, and Ross. Really appreciate your expertise, guys. It's been awesome. Um, all our attendees, you'll be sent a link to watch this after or share it with your colleagues if you like. And um, if you have a minute to complete the post webinar survey, that would be brilliant. Have a great rest of your day and thank you so much for joining us at um, our second ArchiPro webinar. Hope to see you at another one very soon. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Cheers.